Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 155. Today's big Bible question, so what's so bad about being lukewarm? Hello, friends. Another Monday, another podcast or something like that. I hope your weekend was good and your Monday is a blessed one. In a season that's tough all around, look around and find some things to be thankful for and then rejoice in those things. Even in a dark and difficult season, which most of us are walking through, let us walk in the wisdom of Habakkuk. He is the guy who said this in Habakkuk three seventeen through 19 Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. Amen to that. Today's Bible readings include the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, Psalms 88, Isaiah 33, and Revelation chapter 3. And how could Revelation not be our focus passage, considering it has three letters from Jesus in it, to Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea? I've often found it somewhat humorous and strange that there are many churches across the land named after Sardis and almost zero churches named for Laodicea. Now, to be fair, Sardis did actually become a more godly church uh, after the book of Revelation because one of our early church fathers, Melito of Sardis, came from there, and I suspect that means good things, but um, both churches in the Bible are sent fairly scathing letters from Jesus in the book of Revelation, and nobody in their right mind would name a church First Baptist Laodicea, at least I don't think so, but there are many Sardis churches out there. That's very strange. Our focus today is on the very famous letter to the Laodiceans, where Jesus says that he is preparing to vomit or spit that church out of his mouth. Why in the world would Jesus say such a thing like that? Well, let's read Revelation 3 and find out. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I've placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to endure. I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, 
and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So, wow, uh, Jesus uses a very, very strong word in the Greek here. The word is emeo. And it does indeed mean vomit, but maybe with an even stronger connotation than our word for vomit, as Thayer's Greek lexicon notes that the word has the sense of rejecting something with extreme disgust. So why is it so bad to be lukewarm? What does that mean exactly? Well, the word Jesus uses here is the Greek word kleros, and it means warmish or tepid, uh, or as Thayer's colorfully puts it, the condition of a soul wretchedly fluctuating between a torpor and a fervor of love. And torpor kind of means to be in a stunned state, a state of absolute lethargy or hibernation or whatever. It's to go back and forth between hot and cold, maybe oscillating. So this is a big, big deal to Jesus. Better for us to be either cold or hot. Well, why? Well, let's ask our friend Charles Spurgeon for some help on that question. And this is what Spurgeon says. I see the master at the table and his servants place before him various meats that he may eat and be satisfied. He tastes the cold meats, and he eats of the bread hot from the oven, but as for the tepid and lukewarm drinks and half-baked cakes, he puts them away with disgust. He will look on you who are cold and are mourning your coldness, and he will give you heat, and he will look on you who are hot and serve him with the best you have. But of the middle man, the lukewarm, he says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus cannot bear lukewarm religion. He's sick of it. The religion of this present time is much of it rather nauseating to the Savior than acceptable up to him. If Baal be God, serve him. But if God be God, serve him truly. Let there be no mockery, but be true to the core. Be thorough. Throw your soul into your religion. I charge you, young man, stand back a while and count the cost. For if you wish to give to Christ a little and to Baal a little... You will be cast away and utterly rejected. The Lord of heaven will have nothing to do with you. Bless the Lord then, all that is within me. For only such sincere and undivided homage can be accepted of the Lord. One other passage from our friend and brother Spurgeon. The Lord here uses a plain and homely metaphor. As tepid, lukewarm water makes a man's stomach heave, so lukewarm profession is nauseous to the Almighty. He could better endure either the coldness of apathy or the warmth of enthusiasm, but the man who is lukewarm in religion moves him to the deepest loathing. He vomits him forth from his mouth. His very name shall be dismissed from the lips of the Lord with an abhorrence the most sickening that fancy can paint. It is an utterance so strong that no sentence of the most vehement and impassioned orator could rival it. There is such a depth of disgust in this warning against lukewarmness that I know of no figure within the range of imagination and no words in the whole vocabulary of language which could have conveyed the meaning of Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness so fully or with such terrible force. I am going to show you from this text, says Spurgeon, some reasons why lukewarmness in religion is so distasteful to Christ and then to point out to you some dissuasives against lukewarmness urging you to be fervent in your master's cause. I first then am to give you some reasons why lukewarm religion is so distasteful to Jesus. And let me say that it is because it is a direct insult to Jesus Christ. If I boldly say that I do not believe what he teaches, I have given him the lie. But if I say to him, I believe what you teach, but I don't think it of sufficient importance for me to disturb myself much about it, I do, in fact, more willfully resist his word. as I as much as say to him, If it be true, yet it is a thing I so despise and consider so contemptible that I will not give my heart to it. Did Jesus Christ think salvation of such importance that he must need come from heaven to earth to work it out? Did he think the gospel, the good news which he preached, so worthy to be made known, 
that he needed to spend his life in proclaiming it? Did he think the redemption which he wrought out himself to be so invaluable that he must shed his own precious blood in order to complete it? Then surely he was in earnest. So if I profess to believe the truths that he taught and yet am indifferent to them, do I not insult Christ by seeming to insinuate that there was no need for him to be in such dead seriousness that in fact he laid these things too deeply to heart? His intense zeal was not on his own account, but on behalf of others. And according to all reason, those who are the interested parties for whom Christ's solemn engagements were undertaking should be even more earnest than he himself was, if that could be possible. Yet instead of that being the case, here is Christ in earnest, serious, and we, too many of us, are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. This lukewarmness does not merely seem to give God the lie. It does not merely appear to censor Christ, but it does, as it were, tell him that the things which he thought were so valuable are of no worth in our estimation, and it does insult him to his face. Wow, that is strong. And it kind of helps us to understand why it's such a big deal to be lukewarm. It's one thing to utterly reject and not believe the words of Jesus at all. It's a wonderful thing to accept them wholeheartedly and follow them with passion and fervor of heart. But as Spurgeon points us out, uh, points it out to us today, it's really supremely insulting to say, oh yeah, that's probably true. Uh, well, maybe I'll follow maybe when I get around to it. To have a lukewarm response to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is virtually insane. Ponder that, my dear friends, and may the Lord cause my response and your response to heat up day by day, hour by hour. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1. Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, Israel, listen to the statutes and ordinances I am proclaiming as you hear them today. Learn and follow them carefully. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. He did not make this covenant with our ancestors, with, but with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face from the fire on the mountain. At that time, I was standing between the Lord and you to report the word of the Lord to you because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods beside me. Do not make an idol for yourself in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Be careful to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You are to labor six days and to do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your ox or donkey, any of your livestock or the resident alien who lives within your city gates so that your male and female slaves may rest as you do. Remember, you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and so that you may prosper in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give dishonest testimony against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's wife or desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male or female slave, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Lord spoke these commands in a loud voice to your entire assembly from the fire cloud and total darkness on the mountain. He added nothing more. He wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. All of you approached me with your tribal leaders and elders when you heard the voice from the darkness and while the mountain was blazing with fire. You said, Look, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice from the fire. Today we have seen that God speaks with his person, yet he still lives. But now why should we die? This great fire will consume us, and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For who out of all humanity has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the fire as we have and lived? Go near and listen to everything the Lord our God says. Then you can tell us everything the Lord our God tells you. 
we will listen and obey. The Lord heard your words when you spoke to me, and he said to me, I have heard the words that these people have spoken to you. Everything they have said is right. If only they had such a heart to fear me and keep all my commands always, so that they and their children would prosper forever. Go and tell them, return to your tents, but you stand here with me, and I will tell you every command, the statutes and ordinances you are to teach them, so that they may follow them in the land I am giving them to possess. Be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You are not to turn aside to the right or the left. Follow the whole instruction the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live, prosper, and have a long life in the land that you possess. Psalm chapter 88 verse 1. Lord God of my salvation, I cry out before you day and night. May my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry, for I have had enough troubles and my life is near Sheol. I am counted among those going down to the pit. I am like a man without strength, abandoned among the dead. I am like the slain lying in the grave, whom you no longer remember and who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest part of the pit, in the darkest places, in the depths. Your wrath weighs heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves, Selah. You have distanced my friends from me. You have made me repulsive to them. I am shut in and cannot go out. My eyes are worn out from crying. Lord, I cry out to you all day long. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do departed spirits rise up to praise you? Selah. Will your faithful love be declared in the grave, your faithfulness to Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? But I call to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer meets you. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? From my youth I have been suffering and near death. I suffer your horrors. I am desperate. Your wrath sweeps over me. Your terrors destroy me. They surround me like water all day long. They close in on me from every side. You have distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. Isaiah 33. Woe, you destroyer, never destroyed. You traitor, never betrayed. When you have finished destroying, you will be destroyed. When you have finished betraying, they will betray you. Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our strength every morning in our salvation in time of trouble. The peoples flee at the thunderous noise. The nations scatter when you rise in your majesty. Your spoil will be gathered as locusts are gathered. People will swarm over it like an infestation of locusts. The Lord is exalted. For he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. There will be times of security for you, a storehouse of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Listen, their warriors cry loudly in the streets. The messengers of peace weep bitterly. The highways are deserted. Travel has ceased. An agreement has been broken. Cities despised and human life disregarded. The land mourns and withers. Lebanon is ashamed and wilted. Sharon is like a desert. Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. Now I will rise up, says the Lord. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. You will conceive chaff. You will give birth to stubble. Your breath is fire that will consume you. The peoples will be burned to ashes like thorns cut down and burned in a fire. You who are far off hear what I have done. You who are near know my strength. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling seizes the ungodly. Who among us can dwell with a consuming fire? Whom among us can dwell with ever-burning flames? The one who lives righteously and speaks rightly, who refuses profit from extortion, whose hand never takes a bribe, who stops his ears from listening to murderous plots and shuts his eyes against evil schemes. He will dwell on the heights. His refuge will be the rocky fortresses. His food provided, his water assured. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. You will see a vast land. Your mind will meditate on the past terror. Where is the accountant? Where is the tribute collector? Where is the one who spied out our defenses? You will no longer see the barbarians, a people whose speech is difficult to comprehend, who stammer in a language that is not understood. Look at Zion, the city of our festival times. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful pasture, a tent that does not wander. Its tent pegs will not be pulled up, nor will any of its cords be loosened. For the majestic one, our Lord, will be there, a place of rivers and broad streams, 
where ships that are rowed will not go and majestic vessels will not pass. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Your ropes are slack. They cannot hold the base of the mast or spread out the flag. Then abundant spoil will be divided. The lame will plunder it, and none there will say, I am sick. The people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. Yes, Lord, let the heavenly city of Zion come. Amen. Friends, may the word of God bless you and encourage you and lift up your soul and spirit today. May he give you a day of peace and rest and goodness. Good day to you and Godspeed.